Can you introduce yourself to viewers of Brightside News? Sure to you. Good morning. My name is Subramani Kingiri. I'm the head of uh, Advanced Technology Architecture within the office of the CTO at Global Founders. Um, you were at Global Founders from the very beginning. Um, can we go back three years ago and tell us how did you came into Global Foundries? Sure. Yes, you're right. Um, I was, I've been with Global Foundries since its inception in, um, in early 2009. Prior to that, I was the head of uh, TSMC's North America Design Center. And uh, when Global Foundries was being formed, when I looked at the opportunity out there, with the promise of uh, trying to change the foundry landscape, I truly believed it was a great opportunity. And with the starting in the right in the beginning of a great uh, foundry investment was something that was very exciting for me. Yeah, well, when Global Foundries launched, I remember it was called the uh, the most backed uh, startup on the planet mm -hmm. with uh, a lot of uh, resources. So now, three years later, um, can you tell us how many? Uh, Clients, Global Foundries, sir, because you guys started with one, obviously. That's right. That's right, Theo. So when we started, as you know, Global Foundries was a spin-off of the manufacturing unit of AMD, and it was a large IDM. And then transforming from IDM to Foundry was our goal. And I think in the last three years, we made a, a fantastic transition. So today, we have over 150 customers. Within a wide, you know, in a wide range of applications, from um, your CPU to graphics to mobile, to uh, fantastic. It's it's been a great accomplishment in the last three years. Can you single out maybe what was the biggest challenge? Because there was like a lot of uh, a lot of reports going out. That there's process nodes. That there's customer relations. You know, can can you like tell us whatever you know? What was the task that was like the biggest mountain to climb? I would say the the customer service piece was was a major cultural change, right? You know, having been a part of the IDM where it was an internal customer in a way, and serving an internal customer, and that's how we hold uh, the culture and the system, and and all of the framework was built, right? And to transition from there to serve how you know over 150 customers that we are doing today was was definitely the biggest challenge. That's it. Um, Global Foundry started with a single facility in mm -hmm. Dresden and then as you mentioned it acquired uh, Chartered in Singapore and um, did a pretty capital investment in the New York State. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the state of the New York facility? Yeah. So the state of New York, um, you know, the fab that, that is coming up there as you may know it's the most advanced fab in the world, right? And uh, we are planning to, when, when it's fully equipped, it will be approximately able to ship about 60,000 wafers a month. And it does. The, the best thing about this, this approach here is um, the global talent, right? So what we really wanted to do was, as a part of our value proposition, if you look at, I would say, two things. One is the, the geographical risk, and basically the, reducing the geographical risk through global footprint, right? And which is why we wanted to have the fabs in you know multiple locations in the world. We have it in Europe, we have it in Asia. This is the new one in, in uh, U.S. or North America, for that matter. And then the global talent, right? To be able to pull in global global talent and be closer to customers was the primary uh, motivation to have the fab here. So the fab is coming up very well. We are uh, already you know working on full flow, a very advanced um, technology nodes there, and we will be able to ship. Um, Wafers on target. Uh, when it comes to New York, there was a press release that came out on, I think, on the first day of CES that um, you started uh, revenue production with yes. uh, IBM. Yes. Uh, what process node was used? Yeah, so this one was the uh, 32 nanometer you know, technology that we've been jointly developing. As you know, IBM is our technology partner, so we've been uh, working with them very closely. We also have manufactured products for them in the previous generations as well, you know, 65 and 45. So there's kind of a continuation to that. And so this is a 32 nanometer um, SOI technology. Uh, when it comes to um, equipping uh, the New York Fab, uh, what is kind of the target process? Uh, 32, 28, 20, 22? Yeah. So, as you know, we have a wide range of process that we need to support for uh, you know, over 150 customers. We have kind of um, managed it fairly well. So the Singapore, uh, you know, 
the fans will take care of uh, the value added services and all of the uh, technologies out there. And then Dresden is uh, doing some of the 28 and, and beyond. And we're extending that to Fab 8 in New York as well. So New York will take care of uh, 28 and 20 and beyond. Last year, Global Foundries did a pretty big shift in philosophy. Um, the Global Foundries was the only company that went with uh, Gate First mm -hmm. for um, High K Metal Gate, and um, then there was the announcement that the company is moving to Gate Last mm -hmm. with the 20 nanometer. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain us the reasons behind that decision and uh, what led to it? Yeah. So, so the the way to look at it is. Maybe I have to give a quick uh, background of this, right? With the global research that we have, on every technology node, we definitely go do all the pathfinding work across all range of technologies, right? And then pick what is best for that technology node. And on the 28, if you look at going from 40 to 28, there was still room to take care of the density advantages, and we wanted to get the very best. And gate, gate first definitely gave us all kinds of density advantage, and that was the focus there. And we have taken it to volume production. We are perhaps the uh, the foundry with the maximum shipment of uh, high chemical gate. So all that is there, right? But the focus was on the high density there. Then, just like I said, every technology node, we got to go revisit what is the best thing. Then, when we came to 20 nanometer pathfinding, and when we looked at what is uh, what is needed? Density was already there. The next was getting the performance out of it and getting the, you know, so so the 28 uh, gate last high metal gate, uh, sorry, 20 nanometer gate last high metal gate was the choice for 20 nanometer. Now going forward again, we're all here looking at what we need to do. We're looking at a wide range of, uh, you know, technology options from FinFET to ET, you know, ETSOI to even SOI, FinFET to whatever is needed. So we do that on every technology in order to just pick the right one. So on the 28, we truly believe the gate first was the right uh, option. On the 20 nanometer, it is the, you know, RMG. And then on 14, whatever uh, is necessary to be optimal of that technology in order. Um, you have mentioned the uh, uh, FinFETs. Uh, what is your opinion on the planar versus stack transistors? At a very high level, planar has stopped scaling, right? You know, customers definitely want to move forward. There are many applications that are uh, driving the need for low voltage and low power operations. We just technologically, it's it's planar is dead basically, right? So we all have to look at what is the next generation. And uh, the 3D structures like FinFET, whether it's on bulk or SOI, whatever is needed, we are really looking at it very, very seriously. And uh, it's definitely not going to be planar beyond 20. There is a lot of talk in the industry, and pretty much just talk in the industry, about going from 300 millimeter to 450 uh, millimeter wafers. Can you tell us Global Foundry's position on the 450? Yeah. So we are very focused on the leading edge development and uh, we're keeping a track of uh, when we need to transition. 450 will happen, it's just a matter of time, right? But today, if you look at, is the industry ready to go to 450? Really not, because there needs to be all the standards, the equipments have to be ready, and you know, the, it's just not there yet. But yes, we will move to 450, but just that we are not ready to not be as in, not just global foundries, but industry is still not ready for all the reasons I just mentioned. Going pro from process technology to actual chips, mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what technologies do you see pervasive mm -hmm. um, coming out in, in the next couple of years? Because there is a lot of talk about hybrid memory cube, re-RAM, how the new memory technologies will you know, usher us in the new era. Wow, this is a long topic, but let me try to crystallize it into uh, just a few things, right? One thing I would like to share is, if you look at who's actually driving the leading edge technologies, right? If you look at the previous generations, it used to be typically CPUs and graphics, right? But, but if you look at where the world is going with all the smart mobile computing, and it has its own um, you know, parameters and then the priorities, we have seen in the recent past, right on the 20 nanometer and 14 and beyond, the smart mobile computing, or let's put it in general, just the mobile, devices are definitely driving the advanced technologies. Now, what that means is the priorities 
are now switching. It's not necessarily just the gigahertz and gigahertz at any cost, right? It is trying to get the power and the battery life and the cost and the footprint, and then comes the performance. So there is a shift in that. So we got to be able to position ourselves and offer the right technology for those applications. So the, the CPU, GPU will continue to be there, try to continue to drive the leading edge technology, but if you look at the smart mobile computing, that's playing a very important role in the, in the definition of the technology. So to add to that, if you look at what else, right? One is the logic device platform. That is something that we just talked about. But then there are all the peripheral technologies that are also becoming super critical. The amount of embedded memory is becoming larger and larger on every product, as you see. And there's simply no way to accommodate that level of huge memory on the, on the SOC. So it has to be off-chip. So the, the bandwidth, the memory bandwidth, and the power, and the IOs required to make that happen is, is a big challenge. That in turn is driving you know, very high density, low cost memories outside, like some of the ones that you were just mentioning. Also the packaging technologies like the TSVs and other things. So all of them are gonna uh, you know, continue to be driving leading edge uh, SOCs going forward. From your perspective, um, what is the most exciting technology coming out of uh, Global Foundries? If, if I have to say one thing, there are actually a number of uh, things that are happening. Um, definitely, if you look at the node transition, is basically, it's kind of slowing down a little bit, right? You know, if you look at 65 to 40 to 28 to 20, and if you look at the number of design starts and the tape hours that are happening, and if you take a look at how long it takes to wrap up that node, it takes a slightly slowing down. And if you have to still maintain the same level of uh, technology goodness, right, in, in that short time, time frame of two years of uh, cadence, it, it's not easy. On top of that, like I said earlier, the CPUs and graphics are driving the technology, but then there's a smart mobile SOCs, right, which, which, which are driving. So if you have to serve the mobile computing in, in the short time, the most important thing here is the power. Right? So to be able to get low power in a very short time that you can ramp up, we got to be <coughs> able to come up with the right technology nodes where there's a lot of research done, we know how to manufacture it, how to ramp up with low cost. Thank you for the interview. Thank you very much, sir.